Welcome to the short story series. I'm Catherine. Today's story is the true crime genre, and I'm going to read you a story called Suburban Lothario by Edgar Wallace. Edgar Wallace was a British writer of sensational, detective, uh, gangster adventure, sci-fi, those kind of stories, exciting ones. Um, he wrote novels, plays, and stories. Today is in the true crime style, and it's about the case of Patrick Herbert Mahan. There will be more uh, pictures and talk at the end of the story, but for now, please enjoy the story. The Suburban Lothario. It is a natural thing for the humanitarian to say of any man convicted of willful murder that he could not have been sane when he performed the act. And when murder is done in such circumstances and in such an atmosphere as that which marked the destruction of Emily Balby K, more profoundly does the mind of a balanced man grow bewildered. Yet all things were possible with Patrick Herbert Mahan, whose form of insanity took the shape of a colossal vanity. Mahan was a man of pleasing address, popular with women and with his fellow men, for all his antisocial acts, he was in the way of being a social success in certain circumstances and in those circles to which he had the entree. He was born in Liverpool, one of a large family of struggling middle-class folk, a boy of some small talent and an assiduous attendant at Sunday school. So he became an office boy, ultimately a junior clerk. He continued to go regularly to church and took a vivid interest in its social affairs. He displayed some prowess in athletics and was particularly fond of football, becoming indeed a prominent member of one of the local church teams. His early mode of life is described as having been a model for all young men. At school, he first met the pretty dark haired girl to whom his life was to become so tragically linked. She was two years younger than he and their school friendship developed into something warmer at a later stage. Indeed, they were both in their teens when he first proposed marriage. There is a strong opposition by both families, and it was two years after this, in 1910, that they were married. He was then 20 and the girl 18. Perhaps it was a reckless marriage, but this at least should be said, if any woman could have deflected Mahan from the path that was to lead to the scaffold, it was Mrs. Mahan. With singular devotion, she held to him through the black and anxious years to the end. Hers is the real tragedy of this story. Within a year of their marriage, he had forged and uttered checks for 123 pounds on the firm which employed him. With this money, he took a girl to the Isle of Man he was traced and brought back and bound over. Mrs. Mahan forgave him, and they left Liverpool to start life anew. Ultimately, he obtained a position with a dairy firm in Wiltshire. There is no doubt that he had a fund of business ability, and this, with an apparent genial vivacity of manner, served him well for a time. He was still a sportsman and played football for a local team. About this time, a little girl was born. Hard upon this, Mahan was arrested for embezzling 60 pounds from his employers and was sentenced at Dorchester Assizes to 12 months imprisonment. Upon his release, he is known to have lived for a while in the neighborhood of Cane, Wiltshire. There was a mysterious epidemic of burglaries in this neighborhood, and it may or may not have been a coincidence that Mahan suddenly decided to seek other quarters. He is next heard of at Sunningdale, where he was employed by a dairy. This time there was some there were some love affairs which provoked a little scandal. Again, Mahone was thrown out of work. There is a gap here which the imagination may easily fill in. Mahan had been interested in racing and when opportunity offered attended race meetings in many capacities, preferably as a bookmaker's clerk. However that may be, it fell on a day in the early part of 1916 that a branch of the National Provincial Bank at Sunningdale was entered at night. A maidservant who interrupted the intruder was ferociously attacked with a hammer. When she regained consciousness, she found herself in the arms of Mahan, who was kissing her. 
later, Mahan, who had dodged to Wall Wallacey, was arrested and tried at Guilford Assizes for the offense. It was brought plainly home, and after he had been found guilty, he made a whining appeal to the judge to be allowed to join the army. Lord Darling sternly retorted that he was a thorough paced hypocrite whom the army could do without and sentenced him to five years penal servitude. That time he served. A boy was born in 1916, but died a year, to, a year or two later without having seen his father. Mrs. Mahan, left to her own resources with indomitable courage, sought a living for her little girl and herself. She obtained a post with Consul's Automatic Aerators Limited, which had a factory at Sunbury. Her efficiency and energy soon attracted the attention of the heads of the firm, and she was promoted to a responsible position. Mahan came back from prison, full of promises of reform, anxious to be again with his wife. Observe that he always came back, that Mrs. Mahan always took him back. Superintendent Carlin of Scotland Yard made a shrewd observation on this trait. He was keenly disposed to philandering or having affairs with this or that woman casually as they attracted him. But he never, I am convinced, wished to sever his connection with his domestic hearth. He felt in his own mind that the woman he had married was his sheet anchor, that if he cast off from her, he would be adrift. They settled again in a flat at Pagoda Avenue, Richmond, and Mrs. Mahan used her influence to procure him a berth as a soda fountain salesman with her firm. Mahan did well, so well, that when in May 1922 the business was put in the hands of a receiver, he was appointed sales manager. Now, it chanced that the receiver of the company, a member of a firm of chartered accountants, in the beginning of 1923, engaged as a typist a woman. She can scarcely be described as a girl since she was 37 years old, Miss Emily Bilby Kay. Miss Kay had maintained herself by her own efforts for many years. She was a competent, experienced woman, not uncomely, who lived at a bachelor girls club and had managed to put by a sum of money considerable for one in her position. She was not in the least averse from a flirtation with the handsome sales manager. This suburban Lothario, with whom business circumstances now brought her in contact, the affair developed rapidly. She at least fell violently in love. Mahan may have thought that it would end as other episodes of this kind had before ended for him, but Emily Kay was not easily discarded. I think we may accept Mahan's own words on this point. Just before Christmas, Miss Kay was dismissed from the office where she was employed and as a result had a lot of time on her hands and she wished me to see her more frequently, which I was unwilling to do for several reasons. She reproached me on several occasions as being cold and told me quite plainly that she wished my affection and was determined to win it if possible. I felt sorry for the fact that she had been dismissed and did as a result meet her a bit more frequently. I temporized in the hope of gaining time, but from that moment I felt more or less at the mercy of a strong-minded woman whom, though I liked her in many ways, I did not tremendously care for. Mahan was embarrassed, perhaps a little scared, but he went on, and there were certain dabblings with Franks in which he was proved to have had some concern with Miss Kay's money. He asserted that some of his own money had been used in these transactions, but there can be no question that the funds were provided by the woman. Miss Kay was for a short while in employment, but again fell out of work for the time for some time in February of 1924. She probably became aware that she was pregnant, said Mahone. She became thoroughly unsettled and begged me to give up everything and to go abroad with her. I plainly told her that I could not agree to such a course. I agreed to consider the matter, however, in the hope of gaining some time, but she suggested I should take a holiday and go away with her for a week or two and take a bungalow where we would be alone together and where she could convince me with her love that I should be perfectly happy with her. 
This was the immediate prologue to the tragedy. Miss K was not as some of the other women Mahan had made his playthings. She could not be easily thrown aside. Apart from this episode, Mahan felt the ground solid beneath his feet. His income was more considerable than it had been and added to that of his wife allowed for a very comfortable existence. He was happy in his work. He was popular among the social acquaintances in Richmond and the neighborhood. He had become secretary of the local bowling club. Save to his wife, his past was utterly unknown. The future looked full of promise. All this would have to be jettisoned, his career, his friends, his home. And he had a sort of attachment to his wife and little girl if he yielded to Miss Kay and took to flight with her. He fought weakly to save himself. Even so, he might have succeeded had not fate put into the hands of Emily Kay somewhere about this time a weapon against which he felt impotent. It was the first of a number of strange coincidences with which the case was marked. No reference was made to it at the trial, nor did it leak out in the newspapers. Emily Kay was clearing a drawer of some of her belongings. At the bottom of the drawer, someone had placed a sheet of newspaper. As she took it out, her eye lighted casually on the name of Patrick Mahan. Thus she read of his trial at Guilford Assizes. It may be assumed that she had used this knowledge in her interviews with Mahan. She pressed the idea of a love experiment and he gave way. He engaged a bungalow on the stretch of lonely beach between Eastbourne and Pevensey Bay for two months using the assumed name of Waller. This bungalow, no indifferently as officer's house and Langley Bungalow had formerly been the official residence of the officer in command of a Coast Guard station. This was at the beginning of April 1924. Miss Kay received the news with some coldness. She had not intended the experiment to last longer than a few days. However, she sold out her remaining shares and went down to stay at Eastbourne by herself while she looked over the place. Mahan was to join her later. He was very worried. I felt in myself very depressed and miserable and did not wish to spend the three or four days together as she desired. But as I had given my word and as I had felt that I could definitely prove how foolish the hope was on her part to expect to keep my affection, even could she gain it, I thought I had better go through with it. Yet the ruling passion was still strong in him. Two days before he was to take possession of the bungalow with Miss Kay, he met Miss Duncan, a stranger in the street of Richmond, and although it was a wet night, walked with her most of the way to her home at Richmond. He remarked that his married life was a tragedy and invited her to dine with him on the following Wednesday. The episode gives a clue to the psychology of the man. Murder must have been very close to his mind at this time, and yet he could philander with still another woman. On April 12th, he purchased a saw and knife at the shop in Victoria Street and traveled down to Eastbourne and met Miss Kay at the station. They took a cab to the bungalow, and so the love experiment started. So far as his home and his firm was concerned, Mahan was supposed to be traveling on business. Miss Kay had set her heart on eloping to South Africa. She had informed her friends that she was engaged. She had shown some of them a ring that her fiancé had a good post at Cape. In a letter written to a friend on April the 14th, she said that she and Pat intended to spend a little time in Paris before going out. This was the last communication that any of her friends or relatives had from her. On Tuesday, April 15th, the two traveled to London together. Mahan had agreed to apply for a passport, but when they met in the evening to return to Eastbourne, he told her that he had not done so and did not intend to do so. A quarrel broke out in the train. If Mahan's story is to be credited, the woman presented him with an ultimatum when they reached the bungalow. She insisted that he should write to friends that he intended to go to Paris and thence to South Africa. Mahan refused, and Miss Kay, in an access of ungovernable fury, first threw a coal axe at him and then attacked him with her bare hands. In the struggle, this is Mahan's version, they 
fell and she struck her head on a coal cauldron. A little later, he realized that she was dead. I mentioned Mahan's explanation, but few people will be found to believe that it was other than a cold-blooded and premeditated murder. Clearly, he knew that he would be free the following evening, for he had, during the day, wired to Miss Duncan, making an appointment. His story of consternation and horror had a genuine ring. Mahan was a man of temperament, and he felt the reaction. He was face to face with the problem that had confronted many murderers, the disposal of the body. And although he seems to have formed his plans beforehand, witnessed the purchase of the saw and the knife, he had not the nerve to put them into immediate execution. He carried the body to a spare bedroom and covered it with a fur coat. That night he spent in Eastbourne, and on the next evening he dined in London with Miss Duncan. He remembered that he was staying at a charming bungalow and induced her to agree to pay him a visit two days later on Good Friday. He confirmed this the following day by a wire from Eastbourne. Meet train as arranged, Waller, and sent a telegraphic money order for four pounds. This was on the face of it, the act of a lunatic. The body was still at the bungalow. The man was taking a grotesque chance. For what? He himself gave the answer. The damned place was haunted. I wanted human companionship. Unquestionably, Mahan's nerve was badly shaken, and yet to all outward appearance, he gave no sign. Miss Duncan does not appear to have had any suspicion, and she went down to Eastbourne on Good Friday afternoon and was met by Mahan and taken to the bungalow. That day before her arrival, he had commenced a sinister work, and there was one room that was barred to his visitor. He told her that it contained valuable books. The next day, he left her at Eastbourne and went by himself to Plumpton Races. Here, he was noticed by an acquaintance who attached no special significance to the meeting, although it proved to be of vital importance in the chain of circumstances that was to betray the murderer. Mahan recognized by now that the presence of Miss Duncan was going to embarrass him, so he concocted a telegram in a fictitious name and dispatched it to himself as Waller at the bungalow, making an appointment in London for an early hour on Tuesday morning. Thus, he was afforded an excuse for cutting short Miss Duncan's stay. They returned to town on Easter Monday, and somewhere about midnight, Mahan arrived back at his home at Kew. He was back at the bungalow on Tuesday. Here I may tell a curious story, which did not come out in evidence. He had already partly dismembered the body, and he now set to work with the intention of disposing the remains piecemeal. The day was dark and heavy. He built a huge fire in the room, and upon this placed the head. At that moment, the storm broke with an appalling crash of thunder and a violent flash of lightning. As the head lay upon the coals, the dead eyes opened, and Mahan, in his shirt sleeves as he was, fled blindly out to the rain-swept shingle of the deserted shore. When he nerved himself to return, the fire had done its work. It was an extraordinary coincidence that whilst he was giving evidence at his trial, a thunderstorm was also raging. He gave calm denial when he was asked if he had desired the death of Miss Kay. Almost on his words, the court was illumined by a lightning and re-echoed with a crash of thunder. Those who saw his face and knew the truth will never forget that moment when the sound of the storm brought back to his mind that fearful midnight scene he was a broken man when he faced the deadly cross-examination of Sir Henry Curtis Bennett. Mahan discovered that with every method his ingenuity could suggest the disposal of the body was likely to be a long job. Meanwhile, he had to show himself at his office and his home. He returned to his home on the Tuesday night, and during the rest of the week he had to be at his work. On Saturday and Sunday he renewed his labors. On Sunday he conceived the idea of distributing some pieces of the dismembered body from a railway carriage window. He spent some time over the gruesome business of packing a Gladstone bag. No chance seems to have offered itself on the journey to London that evening. 
but he did succeed in getting rid of some portions between Waterloo Station and Richmond, but he was unable completely to empty the bag, and he decided to go on to reading the night he spent in a hotel in that town. The next day, Monday, he returned to London. The bag was now empty, save for the wrappings he had used and a cook's knife. These he probably intended to destroy later. He was acute enough to realize that if he had thrown them away, they might have been identified. The bag he left at one of the cloak rooms at Waterloo Station and went home. Now, although Mrs. Mahan had forgiven more than most women would ever have done, she was a person of intelligence. Mahan's strange comings and goings of late, his messages by telegram, his stories of business out of town, did not altogether impose on her. She knew him too well. Still, although she could not fail to be suspicious, no glimmer of the real truth was present in her mind. Someone had mentioned casually that he had met Mahan at the Plumpton races, and she feared that this was an explanation. Her husband had been previously mixed up with bookmaking, and in spite of his promise to her, it was possible that he had gone back. She found the cloakroom ticket in one of his suits. She took a friend into her confidence. He had been formally connected with the railway police and asked him to discover what it referred to. She had a belief that it might be some of the paraphernalia used by bookmakers. Thus it came about that the bag was closely examined. It was locked, but by pulling at one end, some indication of its grim secret was revealed. Scotland Yard was immediately informed, and Chief Detective Investigator Savage had men posted to watch the cloakroom. Mrs. Mahan was informed that there was nothing to suggest that her husband was bookmaking. Mahan returned for the bag on a Friday evening, May 2nd. As it was handed to him, a detective stopped him. Rubbish, he exclaimed when told that he would be taken to a police station. This little touch of bravado did not help him. He was taken to the station and later to Scotland Yard. The bag was opened and was found to contain a cook's knife which had been recently used. Two pieces of silk, a towel, a silk scarf, a pair of torn knickers, and a brown canvas racket case marked E.B.K. Most of these things were blood-stained and the whole contents of the bag had been heavily sprinkled with a disinfectant. Savage confronted his prisoner with these things and asked for an explanation. Mahan explained, lamely, that he had carried meat for the dogs in the bag. That will not do, said the inspector. These stains are of human blood. You seem to know all about it, retorted Mahan. For a quarter of an hour or more, there was silence. Then Mahan spoke. I wonder, he said, if you can recognize how terrible a thing it is for one's body to be active and one's mind to fail to act. Apart from one other muttered remark, there was again silence for three quarters of an hour. Mahan came to a resolve. I suppose you know everything, he said. I will tell you the truth. He was cautioned, and then he told for the first time his version of the tragedy. I have drawn upon this and his subsequent statements in the account of the affair. The Scotland Yard experts and the East Sussex Constabulary at once got to work. A search of the bungalow revealed many traces of the crime. There were portions of the body and evidence of the attempt to get rid of it, but two very important parts of the body were missing. No trace of the head could be found. This, in all probability, would have shown exactly how the murder was committed. There was no trace of the uterus. The trial opened at Lewes Assizes during July 1924 before Mr. Justice Avery, an experienced and strong criminal judge. Sir Henry Curtis Bennett led for the Crown and Mr. J.D. Castles K.C. for the defense. The point taken by the defense was that the death of Miss K. was an accident, that either during a struggle between Mahan and Miss K, she had died from striking her hair against a coal scuttle, or that in fighting her off, he had unintentionally strangled her. Mr. Castles handled the case with notable skill, but he had to fight some deadly and almost irresistible inferences 
Although Sir Bernard Spilsbury, the pathologist, refused to commit himself to an opinion on the precise matter of death, he was definite in his assertion that it could not have been caused by the woman striking her head against the cold scuttle, which was of fragile construction. He was able to say that Miss Kay, had she lived, would have become a mother. All the shifts and deceits of Mahan during the intrigue with Miss Kay were exposed to the jury. It was shown that over 500 pounds of Miss Kay's savings had disappeared. Three 100 pound notes, which had been in her possession, were shown to have been changed by Mahan in false names at various places. Overwhelming motives were shown by which he might have been actuated to murder. The judge's charge to the jury was a lucid, perfectly fair, but damning summary of the case. Within half an hour, the jury had found Mahan guilty. You may say, as has been said, that none but a lunatic could have acted as he did. But apart from the deed, Mahan acted like a sane, calculating man. I have referred to Mahan's vanity. It is a peculiar trait in all the great murderers that they desire to be thought well of. He cannot bear the thought of leaving a stunned servant maid with a bad opinion, not unnatural, of the man who assaulted her. He is at all times anxious to be considered by his respectable companions as a man of substance and a prince of good fellows, a self-described broth of a boy. There was never a more cold-blooded murderer, except perhaps George Joseph Smith, than this unspeakable villain. Even at the end, when he confessed his guilt to the prison officials, he begged that they would not make public his confession for fear of the bad impression it might make. The end. Well, that was gruesome. Poor Emily Kay. She had the misfortune of falling in love with a no good guy and it cost her her life. Sir Bernard Spilsbury was the worked for the police and he was a scientist and here's a picture of him. Isn't he handsome? He was able to detect that the blood was not uh, dog's blood as um, Patrick Mahan had contended. And this is the house that the gruesome affair took place where he chopped up the body and put the head in the fire. So it's one of those sensational stories and I'm sure it had everybody a buzz and it's remembered 100 years later. So I uh, hope you have a good day. I don't really have any questions for this, but if you have any comments, I would love to hear them, read them. This story is dedicated to the memory of Miss Emily Bilby Kay.